this is Stu and I'm here at Purple Valley again with David Keel and this time um, this book is now out in publish and we are this book a little higher <laughs> this book is now in publish and um, I was so impressed I thought okay now we've got to try and talk to David about some of the concepts that are in this book because a lot of people some people are book people some are people are visual people and it makes a great deal of sense to have a combination of the two so David's luckily agreed to actually talk through some of these uh, principles in here. So my first question to you, David, was can you just explain for everybody the, the concept of how muscles restrict movements around certain joints, and then we can take it from there into some of the stuff that's in the book. Sure. Um, <coughs> well, this, the very simple answer that most people know is that muscle tension resists movement. Um, I think the bigger answer is a little bit more complex than that. Overall, it's more complex than people understand it to be, perhaps even myself. Uh, it's really the coming together of the muscular tissue with its nervous system innervation, the connective tissue that surrounds it, the bone shape and structure as well, and yeah. all of these things converge on, you know, it. it in a way, it's like our, our tension is created in a moment-by-moment -moment way. It's not, it's not as static and fixed as we want to think it is. Just like, you know, we wake up and we're more stiff da -da, than we are in the so evening. It changes so much daily, doesn't it? It changes daily. Mm. And um, I, think it's the, I, I think the most sort of flexible part of flexibility yeah is the nerve innervation and how the nervous system responds to what, how it's being stimulated or not being stimulated yeah. that then leads us to our flexibility or not flexibility. But it's a little bit dubious because you don't just want to be super bendy and flexible. Yes. You need to balance it out with strength. So. Yeah. It's something yeah. that's not that easy to work on within the practice, is it, strength? I know we're going off at a tangent here, but as you brought it up, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's dive in there straight away. How, how can we work on, on strength versus length in the muscles? Well, I, I, I think there's an inherent tension within the tissues, even when you're stretching them anyway. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's, the way I say it is there's really tension for two reasons. There's, there's tension through contraction. That's the obvious one. Yeah. And then because there's also an elasticity to the tissue, when you lengthen them to some degree, they're also going to have a certain tension in them from being lengthened. I mean, some people argue that after you lengthen it and you go into a posture, you should then engage those muscles. I'm, right. I'm not, not convinced. I'm not convinced of that one. I think it's, it comes more from variety and overall muscular use. Yeah. So even though we don't clearly see it as if we went into the gym and we did, you know, like let's say hamstring curls or something, yeah. Uh, you still get it. Like people miss it out in, say, warrior. Yeah. Your hamstrings are on. Yeah. For sure. Your hamstrings are on, but everybody's focused on their quadriceps. Yeah. So they don't pay attention to their hamstrings to notice that they're on. Yeah. Same with the glutes. But then some, there's some postures that really springs to mind is, okay, if there's okay. A, a strength issue missing, then the posture's <laughs> not going to happen. Is I'm thinking maybe like Lagu Vrajasana or something like that. Right. And the... Well... If we start taking this into postures, then you have to then consider that every posture is really made out of a combination of strength, flexibility, technique, and then you could even add in things like breath and banda. Yeah. So it's this soup. It's just like flexibility itself. It's like this soup, this matrix of things that have to come together in order for it to happen. So yeah. I don't really, <laughs> I don't, I'm not so convinced to say, oh, well, Lagravadras, well, since you picked that one. <laughs> Certainly you do need strength, and it is strength predominant, yeah. but technique is important. Yeah. Where you move from, where you press from, wh how you come up, yeah. whether you're breathing, are you holding your breath, your mindset, you know, all of these Everything. things are factors. So. Yeah. And so if we take it back <laughs> to where we were meant to be, and we say, okay, um, so we've got a restriction, or we okay. say, let's say, let's think of rotation around the hips. Okay. So if, for instance, the simplified version, if we want to go into, I'm going to pass it over to you now, external rotation <laughs> at the Ex hip. External rotation at the hip. Well, the basic principle of lengthening any muscle is always going to be that if you know what the muscle does, yeah. then its opposite would be lengthening that muscle. 
So if, you, if we're talking about external rotation of the hip as a lengthening, then it's generally the medial rotators that are going to restrict external rotation at the hip joint. Yeah. So some of those would be for those that have lost us already? Yeah, so medial rotators would be the adductors. Mm -hmm. You would have uh, the front portion of the deep gluteal muscles. And that's about it. Okay. Yeah. And then in your book, so that's, that's the principle that quite a few of us are common with, that those right. that do medial rotation will restrict external rotation, right. vice versa, whatever. And then in your book, which I found really interesting, you, you mentioned that when the hip is flexed, and you know, tell me off if I'm wrong here, when the hip is flexed, then the external rotators will also restrict further external rotation. Right. So can you explain to us how that concept works? That seems like opposite to what you were just saying. Yeah, it is opposite to what yeah. I was just saying. Uh, I like paradox and being opposite, so I just say the opposite <laughs> thing sometimes <laughs> and see what happens, you know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just to get response from you, and then, you know, it could be an argument, and it'll be on Facebook. What is and, it? Yeah. <laughs> well, so the basic concept is based on basic muscle function. And yeah. where does basic muscle function come from? It comes from how we describe the attachment points of muscles and the action that they create, yeah. which is always taught in school from anatomical position, yeah. which would be when the leg is in normal extension or straight. Yeah not flexed. So that's why in the book I also argue for we need to go beyond anatomical position at some point. Yeah. It's good, there's nothing wrong with it, we don't need to erase it or get rid of it, but it's kind of like we need to add on an anatomical position B and C. Yeah. So, and this is one of those examples. So because we're flexing the hip joint, yeah. We, the way that those external rotators sit, um, it flips around basically. We'll, we can do a practical demonstration of yeah, that. Yeah, which with we're going to cut in. Maybe yeah, is that we'll do the spine and I'll show it to you. It's very obvious yeah. once you see it, it's yeah. very obvious. And there's, I don't think there's any way images could show that very well. Yeah. So instead of doing poorly done images, we just yeah. let it be and yeah. left it for questions like this from people yeah. who were super geeks about anatomy <laughs> and decided to email me or <laughs> whatever. What but, going on? but maybe we'll put this up yeah. on the book website or because something. Because it, it you know, it's a quite often a, a level of confusion because, for instance, um, when people are doing like those deep external rotating postures like pigeons, shall we say, sure. when, when I do that, I just feel it in the medial rotators. And but people have often come to me and said, yeah, but I feel it really deep in the hip. Yeah. Yet it doesn't make sense because I'm in external rotation, yet it feels like I'm seeing external rotators. rotators yeah. So this is what we're getting to. This is why they're feeling it in there. Exactly. Because as the hip is in flexion yeah. and it's, everything has changed from, from what we're looking at in the yeah. anatomical and, and just to add to that, yeah. I, I always tell people that you're going to feel it wherever your tension is. Yeah. So if for some reason you have particularly tight uh, adductors, yeah. And this is the other thing, and this is an add-on to where we started this question, yeah. uh, which is basically the exceptions to that rule, yeah. is um, it, muscles always do more than one function. Yeah. So if they're tight from doing, like let's say your gluteals, which are abductors, they take the leg out mm -hmm. to the side, they also flex and internally rotate in the front, and the back portion extends and externally rotates. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're tight from... I don't want to confuse this, but let's say they're tight from abducting. You yeah. just stand there and you abduct all day long, which yeah. nobody does, I know. <laughs> without, without knowing it, they do, but anyway, um, we'll leave that for another conversation, <laughs> yeah. I think. We don't want to lose them all completely. Yeah. So let's say you, you abduct, your, your, your glutes get really yeah. tight from abducting. Because they got tight from abducting, they're also then going to restrict rotation because yeah. they're tight. Yeah. Because the body's not differentiating in a way. Yeah. It's just using as much of the fibers as it can. And sometimes we see that, don't we? Where the limb being pulled in a certain direction oh, when yeah. we're, we're doing one yeah. thing or the other. Yeah. Sure. You know, I like to pick yeah. on the runners and the cyclists. They're yeah. the ones with the tight glutes usually, yeah. and then they can't rotate them yeah. for the same reason. Even though they're not rotating it so much when they're running or yeah. cycling. Yeah. It's just forward back. And we can tie that nicely into what I wanted to talk about next, which was sort of forward folding. But, but the the rotators also can influence our forward folding, can't they? So sure. So how does that work? Well... Because again, we're thinking, a lot of people think, yeah, but they do this or they do this. How yeah. does that 
factors going this well, way? Well, most people, uh, when they think of forward folding, they think of the hamstrings only. Yeah. Right? But yeah, it's certainly the back portion of the glutes are um, extenders of the hip joint. Therefore, they will restrict flexion, which is yeah. forward bending. Yeah. And then kind of along that line of tissue, just below it, you get into those deep external rotators, which we were just talking about. And it's usually the top most portion is the part that would probably restrict the most in there yeah. uh, because they go from the sacrum to the top of the femur. And so therefore, if the sacrum is moving forward at the yeah. hip joint and the femur is fixed, then yeah. it needs to lengthen. Piriformis, for instance, can restrict forward bending. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. Anything along the back line of the body can restrict forward bending. Can calf muscles, calf the bottom of the foot, mm. all the way up to so the back of the neck. Back line. The whole back line really could potentially restrict. And I see this a lot with, um, especially with people with hamstring issues going on. So like sit bone pain, that type of thing? Or It could or be sit bone pain. Yeah. Um, and I've been doing this a lot lately with people with sit bone pain is, okay. I really work their calf and the bottom of their foot Okay. in their forward folds yeah and I find a lot of them have tight ones so I'm looking somewhere else yeah. in the chain of Rather tissue than the hamstring than, itself. Yeah, yeah because the hamstrings already pissed off and angry let's yeah. say so just rubbing on it <laughs> right. you know or grabbing it and trying yeah. to tug and pull on it doesn't yeah. doesn't help so much yeah you know, or it irritates it more yeah so I just take it somewhere else and I've gotten pretty good results with that and what about on that line then what about also maybe pointing the toes as against drawing them back to try and release some of that tension in the lower part of that line. Yeah, uh, that can work too. I, I do that uh, sometimes in Kormasana with students where I, yeah. I get the ball of their foot and I get them to point their toes yeah. into, my, into my feet. So maybe the deeper the forward bend, the more... It, it, it would make sense that the deeper the forward bend, the, the more likely it would have an impact on it, yeah. especially if there's issue going on. Yeah. yeah. And you sort of mentioned there, because Forward bends are quite interesting, aren't they? We Psychologically, a lot of people think of our classic forward bends as Paschimottanasana, um, maybe Janu, and some of those. But like in your book, you, you also highlight the fact that a lot of these postures that are maybe more complex are in fact still forward bends and uh, will be influenced by the same issues that go on with our normal Paschimottanasanas and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um I mean, if we define a forward bend as flexion of the hip joint, yeah. um, Paschimottanasana by itself isn't the deepest of that. Because yeah. there's times where we get our torso right on the inside. Of course, yeah. we have to do a little bit of you know, abduction to get our yeah. chest to go through. But yeah, yeah anything from Kormasana, uh, Supta Kormasana brings in some rotation as well. But yeah. Titi Basana, all, all of these postures are really forward bending postures. Or if you go backwards with it, downward dog yeah. is really a a forward bend. It's a long yeah. one. Yeah. Or and this of course ties into what most people associate with forward bending, which is hamstring tension. And of course, you can see when there's a lot of hamstring tension, downward dog gets rounded, or Navasana the boat sinks, or you know, yeah. All, yeah. All, it shows up in all these ways. Or you can't straighten the knees yeah. in Titibasana or Kormasana. Yeah. Yeah. And and a lot of people like they have issues with okay, they can do Paschimottanasana to whatever degree, and then they abduct the hips with Pavishta Konasana, and then all of a sudden they're not able to fold forward. And they're thinking, hold on a minute, my hamstrings are fine. So what's going on there? Yeah. So uh, the difference there is adductors, no mm -hmm. adductors. So it's kind of like adductor versus hamstring in a way. So if, if you have a lot of trouble, so you started with upavishta, sorry. So if you have a lot of trouble in upavishta, yeah. probably your adductors are tight. Yeah. If you have no problem in upavishta konasana, but you bring your legs together and it's very difficult, then your hamstrings are tight. Yeah. Which is another way to go at the sit bone story as well. So some people think it's their hamstrings yeah. when, in their sit bone, but it's actually something like adductor magnus, yeah. which is the biggest of those adductors and it also attaches onto the sit bone. Just a little bit more medial, isn't it? Just a little bit more medial, exactly. Yeah. 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 Heading more towards the center of the pubic bone. Yeah. And with those wide-legged forward folds, uh -huh. is there any difference between, we often talk about the adductors as that group, but obviously they're varying lengths and one crosses the knee. Um, is there any one of them or group of them 
that are more likely to be the restriction or not? Or you can just say that it could be, mm. just I'm thinking of the yeah. angle of pull from the short ones relative to the long ones yeah. as the pelvis moves. I mean, I think it would, I would hate to ascribe a single <laughs> adductor <laughs> onto somebody who I don't know, yeah. you know, Upavishta Konasana. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, adductor magnus is the biggest of them, yeah. the thickest of them. Most of the adductors are quite thin. Uh, they do what they do quite well, but adductor magnus is a little bit meatier and thicker. And I, I, my guess is I would always start there. Yeah. And then if it got really refined, like the leg can't turn out anymore, or so, yeah. then you start to get into the smaller ones. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps on that same line, when we look at the adductors, the majority of them attached to the back of the femur. Yeah. Yeah. Yet we quite often say that they're medial rotators of the hip. <laughs> now you you're getting super sophisticated, <laughs> Stu. You're showing your oh anatomical God. geekness big time. I can't help it. This is great. Um, How does that work? I, I never, I, I, I don't know if I've ever talked about this in a, okay. in a class. However, Good. Now when, here's, yeah, here's the time. Here it is. Um, however, when um, I taught in, when I taught kinesiology, the study of movement in the massage yeah. school, and I taught all the muscles, this was one of those things because we're like really looking at the details of all the yeah. muscles and of course they're attaching onto the back of the femur, yeah. which would lend itself to most of us thinking that it would externally rotate. Yeah, because it's pulling from underneath. Yeah, yeah. Um, until there's a great, I, I want to say the authors are Kendall and Kendall. There's right. a book, I have to look up the title of the book, yeah. but there's, they discuss this at length and when you look at the gravity line and how it bisects the femur, because remember the femur curves forward a little yes. bit. Yeah. So you get a certain amount of fibers in front of that line. And because of the positioning of the pubic bone behind it, yeah. the adductors end up medially rotating. That's the simplest way to say yeah. it. And I think sometimes it changes, doesn't it, as, as to whether the hip is flexed or not? Because yeah. that changes the position of the pelvis relative to the femur. Once again, yeah. all our basic understanding is from anatomical position. Yeah. The moment you move out of anatomical position, things can change. Yeah. And it happens a lot. And, and you're giving yeah. an example of it. Adductors yeah. are definitely one. It's yeah. just like uh, the psoas, really. You yeah. know, is it you an ad... You wanted to get the psoas in there, didn't of you? Of course I did, yeah. <laughs> You've got to say psoas at least once in an <laughs> interview about right. anatomy. Go on then, get, us, get the psoas it, off your it's mind. It's like... It's not really an adductor unless you're abducted. Yeah. And then it can adduct. But otherwise, it doesn't really have any angle to pull on it. Not, yeah. not well. Yeah. So it's another example of positionally in that direction, then it can do it. Same thing with the adductors. Yeah. But um, adductors, especially, you can feel. Yeah. With if, even at, ni at 90 degrees, if you internally rotate, you can feel them contract. And some people are just popping out, just lying <laughs> in Shavasana, aren't they? They're just like tight. Yeah, probably from different activities they've done over the yeah. years, you know, the converging histories as I write about it in the book. Yeah, you know. and if we, we pick up on one more, because this is one, yeah. again, that, that people often don't think of, but headstand, it's nice, you know, you see people walking in and they raise their legs gracefully mm. with their legs straight or whatever. But that's another again, they say, like, why can't I do that? I'm strong <laughs> and, and whatever. Yeah. Um, why can't I raise my legs straight? And that's again comes back to hamstrings, really, doesn't it? Um, definitely, a big part is hamstrings. Yeah. I'll I'll go back to um, strength slash flexibility slash technique yeah. slash breath <laughs> slash <laughs> the whole I was the simplifying maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the main restrictor for yeah. sure, um, and it kind of brings up another real basic principle yeah. that's good to kind of turn upside down yeah. for a moment, which is. Because we've learned everything from an anatomical position, yeah. we forget that either attachment of a muscle can move towards the other one depending on what we stabilize. Yeah. So when we go up with straight legs in handstand, the hamstrings will restrict our ability to get our legs in enough, yeah. but you also have to have enough strength in the back muscles. Yeah, to keep stable. Not only to keep stable, but also to rotate the pelvis. Yeah. Something's got to rotate the pelvis, because if the pelvis doesn't rotate, then the legs won't raise, yeah. or the legs will raise without the pelvis, and they'll go flopping over, yeah. or not get up, one of the two. 
So the, the point is that muscles work in the opposite way that we know them to work sometimes, especially if we're upside down. Yeah. Especially if we're upside down. And when we're upside down like that, people get confused as well with the whole gravity thing. So like <laughs> when they're in, they're, they say they're in headstand now, yeah. and we say, okay, now control your legs down. Right. And if you say to them, what is it that's bringing the legs down, or how are you controlling the legs down? Right. They're going to say normally, Hip flexors. Exactly. Which is but completely wrong. So perhaps you could explain that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you have um, <laughs> this interesting force in the universe called gravity. Which is why I'm <laughs> sinking <laughs> down like this rather than sitting up straight. Yeah. yeah. Gravity is always working, as it turns out. Um, they still don't know how or why exactly, but they know it's there. So muscles only work when they have a resistance to work against. Otherwise, why would they turn on? So I can do it real simply. I'll do it instead of doing it with hamstrings and, and headstand. I can easily demonstrate with my arm. Yeah. So to abduct my arm, of course, everybody knows deltoids are going to work. Yeah. Well, what muscles are going to contract for me to bring my arm to my side? Oh, none. They just fall because of gravity and the weight of the arm. Yeah. If I want to lower it down in what we call adduction, People would then assume the adductors adduct your arm, but they don't. The deltoids stay on and slowly release the weight until it falls down, which is what we technically call an eccentric or eccentric contraction of a muscle. So people have a, a, a difficulty thinking, but hold on, it's contracting, but and it's lengthening. How yeah. <laughs> this is like a real <laughs> conceptualization yeah. problem, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's always the hardest one. I, so I, I often introduce concentric and eccentric. Concentric is when the muscle is shortening and contracting. Everybody's mind is quite happy <laughs> to take it in that way. Yeah. And then I say, um, well, there's, then there's eccentric or eccentric where the muscle is lengthening and contracting at the same time. And people are like, oh, I don't think you know what you're talking about anymore. Yeah. And um, it's just a harder one to swallow yeah. logically. Yeah. But I think it's a result of the oversimplification of shortening and lengthening muscles that we have, yeah. Yeah. where it's not like the whole muscle is either contracted or not. And the assumption is that if it is contracted, everything is shortened. So I think the more nuanced way of saying it is the overall distance between the ends yeah. is increasing or decreasing. I should have done that backwards. <laughs> increasing or decreasing, right? And, but it's that is irrespective of whether there's more tension or not going into the muscle yeah. and that's that's the nuance difference yeah. of it the contraction itself is separate from the distance yeah and they can really just get a, a handle on it if they just play with it and give themselves some resistance can't they and yeah. actually feel it working hamstrings are a, a yeah. really good example for it because everybody knows where they attach already yeah. and you can very easily maybe we'll cut this one in as well we'll do yeah, the eccentric concentric um, you can see the sit bones sit up, go up higher. Yeah. I must be getting longer. You know, I'll do it. I'll do that as a demo. Perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why good. not? And I mean, we touched on it, didn't we? But in your in your in your book, you you like introducing this concept. In the and in the back of it, you're not going to get it in camera shop, so I won't hold it up. But so the front part is more sort of the anatomical descriptions of the joints and and that sort of stuff. Right. right? And then in the back part is very much what we would call functional anatomy and, and applying it to the postures. And, and you introduce this concept of pinnacle postures. And that, that like for instance, Janu A, shall we say, mm -hmm. is, is a certain amount of external rotation. And then Baddhikanasana is like a double Janu. And right. Can you follow that line along for us and, and expand on, on how you find that's useful for thinking about the different postures? Yeah. Well, what I, what I didn't want to do with the book was just lay out a list of postures and say what muscles were contracting and which yeah. ones were lengthening. It's been done well already. Yeah. And I, I don't want to teach anatomy that way. Yeah. Because what happens is I think students start to parrot. Yeah. And they just... They don't understand. They just remember this is this muscle. Exactly. Muscle, muscle. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm much more about principles and concepts. So when I looked at it, I, I wanted it to be more functional and practical yeah. and so personally I see all of the forward bends being connected through anatomical movements yeah. they have a relationship with each other so I, I set up a pinnacle posture which basically means the deepest forward bend we could potentially do yeah. 
or, or in this case, sorry, external rotation, the yeah. deepest of which is probably leg behind head. Yeah. Um, and then I walk it backwards. Well, what postures create a similar anatomical position? So as you said, Janu Shirshasana A, mm. in, in a way, is the beginning of leg behind head. Mm. Of course, we don't have a tendency to see it that way, but from an anatomical point of view, you're learning how to externally rotate and fold forward at the yeah. same time, which is what leg behind head is. And then that goes into the double pigeon, which really points out how difficult it is to externally rotate and go forward, yeah. at least for most people. Um, even lotus is yeah. part of that external rotation family. I, there might be one more in there, I can't remember. Well, I think the nice one, I don't know whether you can, can you see my knees from that camera? But basically, you talk about I don't know, some people call this box, some people call it fire log. Whatever you and like. And so we're in quite a lot of external rotation, aren't we? Yeah. And I like the little exercise there you had with taking it forward and then maybe to this knee and then to, to yeah. the opposite knee. And, yeah. and so what is happening when we say, it's actually generally the foot of the one that's on top, isn't it? It seems to be yeah. the most intense for the that's leg the one that's I on go top. For. Yeah. So what is, why is that increasing the intensity of the external rotation? to just coming forward, what's happening? That's um, well, it's probably s moving the pelvis away from that, between us, that greater trochanter, which, <laughs> is, which is, for the rest of you, that's the attachment point of those deep rotators and, and the yeah. deep gluteals. Yeah. So it's, we can't say it's only the external rotators, right? It's, they're kind of in this fan shape anyway. Yeah. So as a result, and, and this is basic, hip function anyway, because the hip joint is so mobile and multi-directional, yeah. you have these fans, Tom Myers talks about them a lot, really yeah. nicely. Um, you have this fan shape going on, which means that if you go forward and then you change angle slightly and change angle slightly, it should put pressure on different tissues. Yeah, and it definitely feels more intense as you yeah. take it. I've sort of adopted that one now into my little... Yeah prepping stuff. So, so you were saying, <laughs> you were saying that you, you often feel double pigeon in your yeah. adductors, but when you go off at an angle, do you feel in the adductors anymore? Does so it in go double in the glutes? Pigeon, so in, yeah, in double now I'm pigeon, curious. Yeah. I only, so if I'm coming forwards actually like this, yeah. I actually don't actually feel anything really. But if, <laughs> I, if I come, if I come this way, then actually I feel it in my medial rotator. So I feel it in glute medius, glute minimus. I don't, this is the thing with me. I don't feel it deep in the external rotators, it's, but, but that could just be me. But it's but the same thing anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing anyway. Yeah. But definitely more intense and the, in, the external rotation is increasing for sure. Right, right. Yeah, okay. which is... But you don't feel it in your adductors? No. Oh, okay, that's what I thought. No, no, yeah. not at all, yeah. Um, cool. So if we change tax again, and so we've got, like the, the back of the book is divided into like uh, hips, isn't it? Uh, external rotation, forward folding is one. And You've got back the, bends. I, I, I know I should remember, but yeah, we've got yeah. Uh, forward bending, we've got back bending, back bending, we've got external rotation of the hip, yeah, um, we've got arm balances as well. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and there's one more that I'm missing. Yeah. I think there's there's five arm balances for sure. It's in the front of the book. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I mean, arm balances. Everybody seems, yeah. um, you know handstand is like, <laughs> I mean, you've only got to walk down the, pe the beach and anybody that can possibly hold themselves off the floor wants to try and do a, a handstand. Yeah. You know, something that captures our imagination. Um, but a lot of people struggle finding that balance, don't they? Because I suppose we've only got this much in contact with the floor. Yeah. And we're upside down, and we've got a bit of fear I mean, going on. That's not everything. that much in contact it's with the no. floor compared to that. It's <laughs> we walk around. Well, I've got very yeah. You've got bigger feet. Okay. <laughs> you got flippers on. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. So, <laughs> what is it that is, is causing all the problems, and what sort of stuff do we need going on to make it mm. better, more in line, and anything um, to get a handstand in yeah. on an interview? You got to exactly. do it. It's yeah. Go, and then we can get the cut demo. <laughs> yeah. It's a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, of course. Um, I think most, most people overthink arms yeah. and don't think enough of connecting those hands, arm, into the pelvis of the upper body. Right. Can you, ex you mentioned the pelvis of the upper body in the book, but can yeah. you just explain for those that haven't <laughs> yet received their copy? <laughs> 
I'll give out one secret. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I and I, I, there's articles on the website about this yeah. as well. But um, basically, the the scapula and the collarbone are the pelvis of the upper body. Okay. They mirror it. They look. They if you take them out and you put the, and you hold them closely together, it looks a lot like the pelvis, just that by itself. Um, so. The difference is, is that the scapula is really mobile. Right. Uh, and which it's supposed to be so that the hand can move into any position. Yeah. Uh, so what you need to do first is stabilize your scapula. And it's from stabilizing the scapula that you create the foundation. So this is the foundation that touches the floor, but it's yeah. the foundation of serratus anterior, yeah. for instance. Not that deltoids and triceps and uh, don't work, they do, but really at the sort of core of yeah. the upper body, that's why I call it the psoas of the upper body, right, yes. Right. yes. Sorry. Um, Sorry. That, that's really what you need to get after and find. Yeah. Makes all the difference in the world. If you don't have that, you're, not, you're just not gonna find handstand very easily. And the, another arm balance, Bacassino is like maybe one of the the first that we encounter as far right. as the Ashtanga practice anyway, isn't it? Really, maybe. Yeah. Um, and that that is challenging quite often. And then we see people then being able to transition from Bacassino to handstand. But I mean, I've been doing it for yonks, and individually they seem pretty okay. But can't put them together. The idea of lifting from Bacassana to handstand seems like, for me personally, like a camera trick, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. We'll get you I've to do it, it in the demos, oh, dude. No, don't you yeah. worry. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> so what's going on there? What, is, what do you need to change? Men what's going on in your mind as you're going from Bacassana to handstand? What are, you, what are you thinking of moving or what are you thinking of stabilizing? Armpit banda. Armpit banda. Serratus, because here's another example of a muscle moving what we normally normally we consider serratus it attaches onto the rib cage yeah. and then it goes off and attaches onto the scapula and typically causes it to do upward rotation yeah. uh, and protraction both if your hands are stuck to the floor and your hand is connected to your forearm and your forearm is connected to your humerus and your humerus is connected to your scapula mm -hmm. it means your scapula can't really move very much yeah. maybe up and down a little bit but it's not going to move that much. So serratus actually rotates your rib cage to go from bakasana to really up tough. bakasana. Yeah. Yeah. The only difference, if you look at one really closely, the only difference you're going to see is really at the shoulder, and, and not even at the literal shoulder, but at the scapula. At the scapula. The yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's all from there. I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah. Good. So I think um, perhaps one we've got a chance to just talk about one more thing before yeah. then we're going to take it inside yeah. to look at some stuff. Um, back bends is the other section, and you <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, small subject. Yeah, small just subject. Uh, just add this we've one. Got in like there. five minutes. Yeah. Um, so again, you d nicely divide it into sort of beginning back bends, and a, a lot of people don't think you, uh, even they forget like about up dog is a yeah. back bend. You know. So Most perhaps definitely. you could talk us through some of that. Um, okay. So the basics are, and again, the, the back half of the book is really about seeing the interconnected nature of movement yeah. within a yoga practice. Um, so where do we first begin to train the movement of taking the spine from neutral or flexion into yeah. extension and hyperextension? Yeah. And the first place we do that always is upward facing dog. So uh, is it as deep as a full wheel? No, it's yeah. not. But you still learn how to move or not move yeah. in your spine. So most people classically bend their lower back and that's it. They don't give it much thought other yeah. than that. It's not easy to move in your upper back. Yeah. Um, but up dog is a very important posture. And in there you talk about yeah. this accessing of the upper back yeah. And, and about keeping your head down as you start to come up and then raising it when you're in the up position. Yeah. And that allows a little bit more work in the upper back. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a, a very much a personal discovery. Yeah. It, I think I say in the book, it took me about three years to really feel 
the difference happening in my spine. Yeah. I don't know how much difference is really there. I, I, the felt sense is, is in a way more important at this point. Yeah. I mean, I've been playing with it this week because John, because luckily, guys, I've been practicing with David and John Scott this week. And uh, that's the first thing, one of the first things John, because he's obviously thinking along the same lines, did with my head as in my up dog yeah. and, chat and uh, back to down dog. And by the end now, we're getting towards a week and a half in, I'm definitely feeling that that, that up dog is, is changing and it feels nicer. Yeah. Yeah. I, just with the head, because I've not changed much else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, and I got it from John Scott. He, yeah. he did it to me the first time uh, he so, saw okay. me. He was smacked the back of my head <laughs> as hard as he could really to keep doing. it down. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I didn't think about it so yeah. obviously anatomically at that point. Yeah. But after years of working with it and, you know, experiencing it, the, the way I've rationalized it all is yeah. by going this way first, you're separating these vertebrae. Okay. Right, the thoracic the vertebrae. Yeah. yeah, and then by the time you're moving back into up dog, I mean you go through neutral. They're still not going to like. They're not going to bend like that, right? But what does happen is, if you can get your proprioception to go from and inside of that to go from here, even to here, yeah, and you build up that proprioception, then you you can connect to where to put the pressure yeah. with your own tissues. And so what happened for me after, and I say it took me about three years, but whatever it was, I don't even remember, two to three years, yeah. literally, to the point where w finally one day in Up Dog, I felt the muscles in the upper part of my back start to like, like if I kept going, they would have spasmed or, you know, over contracted yeah. or something. Yeah. Not my lower back, my yeah. upper back. Yeah. And, and that's a critical thing when you take that and expand it outward into a full wheel. Because most people are overdoing it in their low back and not putting anything in their middle and upper back. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the general, my general story about backbend is you want to distribute it through as much of that spine as possible. Yeah. Why not start that off in up dog? Up dog, down dog. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for You're giving welcome. us your time. And, and it's a great book and um, it's just loads of information in there. And, and um, hopefully now we're going to cut some stuff in so it will all make sense when you see the finished article. Cool. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. Thanks, man. So here we are. We're with um, looking at the deep external rotators and this idea of external rotation. All right. So we'll, we're, we're going to use the strap to represent. This is really the piriformis line more than anything. Anything from piriformis down to here and maybe even up into this height would, would, would be the same thing. So we can see very clearly if, uh, here's the femur, here would be external rotation, hence it's getting shorter. So if I go to medially rotate, it, it gets restricted if I keep this pinned on. So what we were talking about was what happens when you go into flexion. So I can either, if I flex the leg up, this is going to stay attached to this. So now here's the leg in the front. If I externally rotate, it's tugging on it. Or you might see it more clearly if I internally rotate the leg, it's getting more slack. So external rotator resists external rotation. So if we take this, we put it into, let's say, let's call this the double pigeon zone. Or you know, I'll keep it here. If you flex the hip joint a little bit more, fold it in or lift that up. And as you fold into it, it gets longer. It gets stretched, right? If we undo that, softens. Or if you undo that, also softens it. Yeah. yeah. That's how it works out of anatomical position. Cool. Cool. So let's, let's talk eccentric, concentric for a, for a quick moment. So concentric is the obvious one. That's where the muscle gets shorter during the contraction. Eccentric is where it gets longer during contraction. So we'll, we'll do the hamstrings, which most people know attach just below the knee joint and then to the very popular sit bone. So let's use a forward bend as an example. If I forward bend, look at where the sit bone is relative to the knee. If I do the forward bend, you notice the sit bone has moved away from the knee. Therefore, the muscle has gotten longer. Anybody doubting that? No, not doubting that. If I stand back up, the sit bone has now moved towards the knee. It's shortened. So the next question that comes up is, well, now you're saying it's contracting while lengthening, and that's the tricky part to get over. So if we did a forward bend and we had no muscular contraction, it would just fly forward. Nothing would be resisting it. 
So if we do it with resistance, and that's what we do when we do a forward bend, we slowly go in this direction. The hamstrings are anchoring the sit bone, keeping tension while also allowing it to lengthen. And that's what we call an eccentric contraction.